to cast Robert Patrick. And Roger, Robert Patrick, he has such a great physicality in this role. And some of his body movement inspirations were a shark moving in on its prey. And also he mimicked his head movements on that of a bald eagle. So when he kind of like rotates his head around, you, you can see that. he He's really bringing a lot to it. Much like Arnold in the first film, you know, there's not a lot of dialogue. It's all about body language here. Robert Patrick does an A plus job and running as well, right? Uh, who, what what an A plus runner Robert Patrick is in this movie. He's no Tom Cruise. <laughs> Fair enough. Your man crush on Tom Cruise continues. Um, now, now Edward Furlong. This was his first movie. That's why the credits say introducing Edward Furlong. And James Cameron said that the main factor that convinced him to cast Edward Furlong was his physical resemblance to Linda Hamilton. Which I'm, I don't know, sure. do do, I guess yeah. they look sure. enough alike, right? <laughs> Whatever you say, James. Uh, but this production took over took place over such a long period of time that Edward Furlong, he visibly aged during the shoot. And you can, if, if you kind of know you're paying attention, you, you can tell like some scenes he looks younger and his voice is a little higher. Like they had to adjust his the pitch of his voice in some scenes like to kind of match throughout the movie. Like in the desert, for example. Uh, he's he's younger there, and you can kind of you can definitely hear it. And uh, Edward Furlong had to redouble all of his dialogue as well, to just to help with the consistency throughout. But that's what you're that's what you're doing dealing with when you work with kid actors. You never know when when puberty is going to hit. I guess right. Mm-hmm. And then you know, for us here on the on the shows, we've now covered his first two films. <laughs> we we have <laughs> the Go Edward Furlong podcast. Two. Oh yes. man! So how old do you think John Connor is in this film, Brandon? Um, well, he's got to be like around, he's, I think the character is supposed to be like nine, but he's clearly like, I don't know, 13 or 14. Yeah. So Edward Furlong was 13 when they filmed it and the character is nine or 10 and that becomes kind of a kind of Nine or 10 year old don't really ride dirt bikes like that. Yeah. They, this is, this guy is clearly like 13, but they kind of paint themselves in the corner of like, well, judgment day this year. Because then it would be 1997, but it was a couple years in the future. Terminator 3, they actually mentioned that he was a teenager, or they actually say 13. I haven't, I haven't watched that one yet for for the podcast. We'll see, but that, that will become a continuity problem when you do the math. But there's a lot of continuity problems with that film. We're not talking about that one just yet. But um, interesting bit of trivia that I was unaware of, Denzel Washington turned down the role of Miles Dyson. And it, this was his quote. He said, quote, no offense to Jim Cameron. But when I read the script, I thought all he does is look scared and sweat. I had to pass. So, <laughs> um, and then, of course, Joe Morton ultimately played Miles Dyson. And he kind of carved out a nice niche for himself in a bunch of sci-fi genre projects as the crazy scientist guy who is somewhat involved or, or heavily, usually heavily involved with artificial intelligence. He plays the same kind of character in Stealth, a movie with Jamie Foxx about uh, an artificial intelligence with fighter jets. Uh, he was on Smallville, you know, the podcast that I'm always plugging, that I have a podcast for. Uh, he played the role of Dr. Hamilton as a recurring character in the first two seasons of that show. Uh, staying with DC Comics, he actually plays the father of the superhero Cyborg in Justice League. And if they make another you know, extension of that movie, they talk about Cyborg solo film. He would be in that film as his father. Uh, I, cyborgs, hello. You know, he has a lot of experience. Uh, he was also an eccentric scientist character on the sci-fi television show Eureka. So this guy is all over the place. So it's a good thing Denzel Washington turned down that role because Joe Morton has really made a career out of playing this kind of character. I've seen none of those. <laughs> <laughs> now, have you seen the season nine episode of the X-Files Red Rum, Brandon? Yes. <laughs> yes. So Joe Morton and Robert Patrick appear <laughs> in that episode together. And yeah. I, I have a funny story about that. I, I have a friend of mine. And he was uh, watching this episode of that episode, The X Files, once, and his brother came in. And he's like, "Are you watching Terminator 2? Because he just because <laughs> he just saw uh, Robert Patrick. He's like, "No, I'm watching The X Files." And then he sees Joe Martin. He's like, "You are watching Terminator 2." He's like, "No, this is not Terminator 2." <laughs> so just funny that they ended up in the in the same episode there. Uh, now, uh, Dean Norris has a very small role yep. as the SWAT team leader. Okay, uh, he had worked with Arnold in Total Recall uh, just before this. And interesting note here. Dean Norris, you know, he's became his uh, claim to fame at this point is being on Breaking Bad, but he also was in two episodes of the Sarah Connor Chronicles uh, in uh, the the second season of the Sarah Connor Chronicles. So not not the same character or anything, but he just he reappears in the Terminator universe down the road. There, um, hashtag it's all connected. Hashtag it's all connected. Yes, uh, Danny Cooksey plays 
John's friend Tim. Uh, he was uh, Butnick on Salute Your Shorts. It was the show I always used to watch on Nickelodeon. He looked exactly the same, too. He had the same silly haircut. He was the same age. So I was like, oh, man, it's the guy from Salute Your Shorts, John Connor's friend. So <sighs> lots of familiar faces throughout this uh, throughout this film. And interesting, and I didn't think about this until researching the trivia, but uh, unlike the T-800 and then later on the TX and the other Terminators, we never see a POV shot of the T-1000, Brandon, of the Terminator uh... vision. Oh, really? Okay. Mm-hmm. I never thought about so, it either. And, you know, who knows how that machine works, that liquid metal, you know. <laughs> oh, okay, well then, ha- okay, we might see one. Okay, but it's not like Terminator Vision, though. So it's like right after he appears and he comes around that thing to kill the cop. Ah. We got that one camera pulls in on him. That could be a POV shot. It's just not thermal Vision. Fair enough, fair enough. Good call, good call. Now, uh, this is something that I really wish they did, but they didn't do it. And in the original script, they were going to have uh, the end battle of the Resistance versus Skynet, where they find the time displacement equipment, they send Kyle Reese back in time, and then they go and they f- they see that the T-1000 has been sent back, so then like they have to send back another Terminator to fight that one. And that, that, that was all in the script, and it's in the novelization as well. But ultimately... Uh, they were already had such a high budget that they was that was deemed unnecessary for the movie, so they cut it. And I really feel like if they had left that in there, like then the circle would be complete in the Terminator franchise, and we wouldn't really need to keep because that's what keeps me going with this franchise. Let's close the loop. I want to see calories go back in time, uh, and I guess we kind of got that in Genesis, but that's like a discussion for another time. Um, the T one thousand. There is an explanation for. Uh, how it gets to travel back in time because it's the whole thing. Nothing dead goes through. It got to be covered in skin. Uh, the idea, and this is again, this is something in the novelization and the script. The idea was that the T one thousand went through time in a flesh sack, <laughs> but that that idea was never mentioned in the movie or anything. But that's how it it got through, and you can just assume that it, it did such a good job of mimicking uh, human flesh. Uh, so who knows, right? Uh, so then a couple other bits of trivia. Throughout the uh, throughout the film here, the part where Arnold goes to the bar, right, and gets the clothes, right, that's something that the studio wanted to cut, and they tried to get Arnold to convince James Cameron to do it, but Arnold says only a studio guy would cut a scene out like that because <laughs> that's like you know that's a very essential part of the film. So I'm glad they I'm glad they kept that in, and uh, in the scene where Arnold Schwarzenegger is uh or you know the T hundred he's telling Sarah about Miles Dyson and the history of Skynet, uh, Arnold is reading his lines from cue cards that are taped to the car's windshield while they're driving, because that's, the, that's a pretty big monologue uh, for Arnold to give at that point. So, uh, And then, you know, finally, at the end of the film, uh, a couple of last notes, uh, the damaged T-800 look that Arnold has in the film, it took five hours a day uh, to take on and take off total. So Arnold spent five hours in the makeup chair at the beginning end of the shooting days for that. So... When he has his famous Hostel of Vista Baby line in the Spanish version of the film, it is changed to Sayonara Baby to preserve the humorous nature because that'd be like, oh, he just told him goodbye? What's what's funny about that? <laughs> yeah. um, and then finally, there is an alternate ending that was filmed but cut and is not present in either you know official version of the film. And instead of the road, the unknown future that lies ahead... Uh, which is, you know, and once you know this, you understand why they used stock footage of a road that we already saw earlier in the film as the ending. The intended original ending was they stopped Judgment Day. And mm-hmm. it's the future, and it's 40 years in the future, and you see old Sarah Connor in, in a park, and John Connor, the same actor who played him at the beginning of the film, the war-torn John Connor, he's fine. He's a, he's a senator, apparently. He's playing with his kid in the park. Uh, actually, in the script, they thought, oh, well, they always, they always keep trying to work Michael Beatty in here, but it doesn't work. Uh, but they were going to put uh, young Kyle Reese in there to kind of drive the point home that this is the future and it's fine. But then, they again, they thought, okay, well, that's really confusing because if Judgment Day never happened, how did Kyle Reese go back in time and become the father of John? So like, they axed that, but they still filmed the scene. But ultimately, uh, they decided, you know what, let's cut that. And I agree with that decision, Brandon. I assume you've seen that scene. Yeah. I'm not the biggest fan of it. What did you think about them dropping that as the end of the film? 
Yeah, I've actually watched it in context. So the the steel, I have, it's not a steel book, but it's like it's the Terminator Two. I think they called it the Ultimate Edition. Yes, yes, I, yes. Me and my dad. I think I gave that that to my dad for Christmas like ten years ago or something. Yeah, like, on I know DVD. What you and you type in a Judgment Day code in the menu, and it unlocks the ability to watch it with that scene in context. So I have seen it in the movie, and I don't think it works very well in the movie itself. I think honestly, I think the road is. A better ending myself. Even though we saw it before, I think it's a better ending. And also, it leaves it open to sequels, right? right Which that right. one really closes off. And, and the idea, and again, if they had done, you know, the real the prologue with the time displacement equipment, and then the end cap with the future, you know, it kind of like puts a cap on everything. And then you have Sarah Connor's narration throughout. So, yeah. and then you actually, if you notice, it's she's talking into a, like a. Uh, a recording device like she's still making tapes for john in the future it looks like uh Mm -hmm. in that scene so it's like that that continues on you can imagine that these narrations you heard from her throughout the film are just her tapes for john yeah uh, which is interesting framing device for the film i thought too because the narration randomly shows up at times and randomly goes away but anyway there you go there's your trivia for terminator 2 there's a lot to it Again, like these other films, like The Godfather and Jaws, you could spend we could spend another you know day talking about this stuff. But those are the highlights that I wanted to share with the listeners. Well, so we don't forget about it. Let's why don't we talk about the the uh, extended scenes here for a minute? Yeah. Okay. So while there's nothing inherently wrong with any of them, um, I really like the pace of the theatrical cut. And even last night, so I watched the I watched the extended cut, and then I actually immediately put on the theatrical cut. I actually watched them back to back because I haven't seen this movie in like fifteen or sixteen years, and this movie's a freaking masterpiece. Okay, like this movie is outstanding. Um, I do prefer the pacing of the fir- of the theatrical cut because it is a little quicker, and it it keeps you on the edge of your seat a little bit more. Now, I like the extended scenes, like the stuff with the dream sequence with Kyle, you know, like the when he kills the dog and things like that, because it just, it, it flushes out the story a little bit more. Mm-hmm. But if I did have to pick, I'd pick, uh, I'd probably pick the theatrical cut as to probably my preferred version. But again, I do like those scenes at the end when the T-1000 is degrading. Uh, I think that those should have been left in, but... Um... Yeah, because yeah, like even, it's not really a scene; it's just little snippets. So I think they yeah, could, like, definitely could have left that in, right? And like even the scene where they take out the chip, the chip. Like while that's a great scene, it isn't necessary because in the theatrical cut, the Terminator just says, "The more time I spend with humans, the more I learn," mm-hmm. which makes sense to me because these. Terminator probably wouldn't last very long, so they wouldn't get to the point where they would learn enough. You can see how, it, you know, once you know about all these scenes, a lot of the other context and everything makes sense. Like, like this scene, for example, with the chip, right? In the theatrical cut, they do some ADR. The more around humans, the more I learn. I'm like, oh, okay, right. cool. It's a learning computer. Uh, but then the next scene, the morning, you know, John gets the keys out of the uh, the visor in the car. He's like, are we learning yet? So it's like, oh, we just reset your chip. Are you learning yet? That kind of thing. And then he's trying to teach him more about humor and all that. But all that still 100% works the way they did it in the theatrical cut. But I think the crux of that scene, though, and the the, the reason that I really think they it, it serves a great purpose in the film is because John and Sarah like have an argument about, are we going to... Yeah. She wants to kill the Terminator. And he's like, hey, look, if I'm going to be some great military leader... Maybe we should start listening to my decisions because if my own mother won't listen to me, why should I expect anyone else to? And that really wins over Sarah. Like, okay, we're going to play it your way. And I think that was an important like power dynamic shift for the two of them. Uh, that eventually, you know, John starts to, you know, he's still a kid, but you can see that the steps to where he needs to be in the future. So I thought that was a really important scene, more so for the two of them. And it, you can understand why she would want to destroy a chip because she's right. like, she says, you know how hard it is to kill one of these things. Um, and also, you know, and that, but that shows you they weren't afraid to cut, because, like, some intricate stuff because this is the scene with, you know, Linda Hamilton's twin and they have the mirror shot. And, like, this is a very intricate sequence and they just cut it out. So uh, applause yeah. for the editing there. Um, the, the Kyle Reese scene could also, like, it's great to see Michael Bean again as the character, but it's something that you wouldn't miss if it were gone. But the only thing there is it kind of adds a sense of urgency I guess to Sarah wanting to escape because oh you're the target he's the target now and that kind of thing. That other than that you just again you don't need it, but it kind of triggers why she wants to escape and 
And but it know, also doesn't really make sense. Like, why is this dream going to tell her this stuff? Like, it's not really Kyle Reese from the future <laughs> telepathically telling her what's going on, right? Yeah. So, I don't know. Like, that's the scene that I think is... The, the, what I like about... 